Welcome back to Physical Anthropology. Today we are covering Chapter 7, Understanding the Fossil Context. Our topics for today include an overview of the history of life on Earth, studying remains including mummies and bog bodies, looking at the different types of fossils, and then comparing relative and chronometric dating methods of the fossils. So let's take a look at the history of life on Earth. Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Early Earth would not have had any life because it was very, very hot. So it took many, many millions of years for Earth to solidify so that there was a crust and also to cool off enough for liquid water to be able to accumulate. Once liquid water formed oceans, we do start seeing evidence of life. The earliest living organisms that we have evidence for arrived 3.5 billion years ago, and these early primitive cells are going to be very similar to our modern bacteria cells. They're basically prokaryotic, meaning no nucleus, and they uh, evolved in something called the Archean era. So this is the Archean era. There's actually five eras of Earth's history that I'm gonna look at. Archean, the Proterozoic, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and then the Cenozoic, which is our current era. So during this Archean era, only these small cells were floating around in the water. And it took quite a long time before a new type of cell evolved. This new type of cell is going to be our eukaryotic cell, which we discussed in a previous lesson. These cells do have a nucleus and they have organelles, but they didn't arrive until about 2 billion years ago. So there was a long period of time where only these very primitive prokaryotic cells were around. After that, evolution starts to speed up. So once these eukaryotic cells evolved, uh, they were unicellular at first, but eventually they started to form organisms that were small balls of cells and then started to have a body shape. And we start seeing some primitive animals. Now, right around here, a little uh, after 500 million years ago, we have something called the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion was a very fast evolution, a very rapid evolution of many, many different types of organisms. And again, these are still aquatic. So they were all inside of these oceans and many of them have gone extinct since then. But the ones that did survive, they are the predecessors of all the modern animals that we see. So after this uh, very rapid evolution, the Cambrian explosion, we did have a massive extinction. So whenever you see a little star like that, that means there was a mass extinction. Many life forms went extinct, unfortunately. But when some things go extinct, this opens up niches where new organisms can evolve to take over that area. And so we do see the evolution of fish. Okay, so um, the very first fish would have been cartilaginous fish. They did not have a bony skeleton. You see the evolution of things that are very similar to modern sharks. So they would have had jaws with teeth, but they did not have a bony skeleton. After that, you do see the evolution of fish with the bony skeletons, and then eventually the predecessors of amphibians. So over here, around 340 million years ago, we finally have the first amphibians. Amphibians are gonna be the first vertebrates that can come to land. And that's because they are able to breathe air in addition to living in the water. These amphibians are going to be the ancestors of all land vertebrates. So from them, we're going to get things like reptiles and then mammals, as well as birds. So all of this is still happening quite a long time ago. This is in the Paleozoic era. So now let's move to the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic era is one you're probably familiar with because you've heard of dinosaurs before. So the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods all belong in the Mesozoic era. And this was a very long time period. You can see it's between 65 million years ago to 252 million years ago. That's a very long time period where dinosaurs did exist. And so we call this often the age of the reptiles because they were the most massive organisms on earth at the time. Unfortunately, at 65 million years ago, unfortunately for the reptiles, uh, another mass extinction event occurred. And so that's when the dinosaurs went extinct. Now, some reptiles did survive, right? We do have smaller reptiles that are on earth right now, but none of the original dinosaurs. In fact, the only part of the dinosaurs that survived are their descendants, which are the birds. So birds actually do belong in the group reptiles as well. They're the descendants of the dinosaurs. In addition to this, we're going to see mammal evolution during the Mesozoic period. So we do see the very first mammals start to evolve. They're 
a very tiny, they're living in the forest, they're kind of hiding out. But once the dinosaurs went extinct, the mammals now are able to take over those empty niches. And so the next era, the Cenozoic era, it's now the age of the mammals. So all of these mammals are going to evolve. We're gonna see massive mammals, including things like uh, mammoths that evolve. And of course, you probably heard of uh, the ice age. So once the ice age ended, that's when a lot of these really large mammals did go extinct, but we do still have mammals all over the world today. Now our human ancestors or hominins didn't really start to appear until about 7 million years ago. So around here, about 7 million years ago. And these are going to be our first bipedal apes that are walking around and then they're going to continue to evolve until we get to modern humans. Modern humans really didn't come into being until about 300,000 years ago at the earliest. Uh, they would have evolved in Africa and then migrated out of Africa to all of the other continents. The modern epoch that we are in, so that's a, a subcategory of the Cenozoic era. Or, um, yeah, so right here is the epoch and it is called the Holocene. So that's where we are living right now. So some other information for you. The world looked quite different hundreds of millions of years ago. There was actually a gigantic landmass called Pangaea and Pangaea existed in, um, in a way that the modern continents were not quite the same climate that we would expect today. And that's because when this massive continent Pangaea existed, it was about 225 million years ago. Notice that this is um, what's going to become South America and this is Africa. And those are still right there around the equator. But some of these other parts, like this is going to become India, it's also down here. Now this massive continent did start to break apart. And the reason for that is something called continental drift. What that means is that even though the earth cooled enough to form a crust, underneath the crust, there is still molten uh, magma. And that magma is moving around. Think of it almost like a, a river, a current. And because it is moving around, the crust on top of it is able to float around. Think of like ice floating on a pond and it moves around. And as it's moving around, this massive continent broke up. You got two subcontinents called Laurasia and Gondwanaland. And this actually happened right around that time of the dinosaurs during the Triassic period. So when the continents start to break up and you can see the transition here, it's moving now to the Jurassic uh, period over here and then to the Cretaceous period. So right around the end of the dinosaurs, uh, the modern continents are definitely falling further apart from each other. India is still here. So India is still not connected to uh, Asia at this point, but they are drifting apart. The fact that they're drifting apart is important because we did discuss previously the idea of speciation and that one of the ways that uh, evolution occurs and speciation occurs is that animals are unable to interbreed with each other. So if you have animals on one continent and now they're separated by this uh, large ocean, there's no way for them to interbreed. And so evolution is gonna occur more rapidly when they're separated. We do have evidence of Pangaea existing and the type of evidence we look at is the idea that there are fossils of the same type of animal across different continents. So for example, if you have the fossil of this creature right here and uh, it is found in both South America and Africa, then the question would be, well, how on earth could it possibly have crossed the Atlantic Ocean? Well, the reason is that it didn't have to because these two continents used to be connected and so it was able to just walk across um, just normal migration patterns like that. And we have plenty of other examples as you can see in this chart. Okay, so here are some questions for you. Do you remember how old is the earth? So the answer should be 4.6 billion years old. Next, the current epoch is called the blank epoch. So if you're not sure, go back to that timeline and try to find out when are we living right now? It is in the Cenozoic era, but it's also called the Holocene epoch. Next, let's get into studying some animal remains. There's a word, taphonomy, which means the process, studying the processes that affect organisms after death. And the first group of remains I'm gonna look at are remains that still have soft tissues, skin, hair, things like that. 
So it's very difficult usually to get these kind of remains because after, after an animal dies, it starts to decay almost immediately. And the decaying is happening because there's bacteria that live on the organism and inside of the gut and things like that. And those bacteria are breaking down the cells. The cells are dying and they're being uh, recycled and used by these other organisms. So the microorganisms are gonna eat up all of your soft tissue. And usually the only thing that really remains are your bones. We'll talk about uh, bones and fossils in a little bit. So how are we able to learn about things like, you know, feathers and fur and what people used to eat tens of thousands of years ago? Like, how can we figure out all of this? Well, sometimes we do find entire bodies preserved. And one really interesting example is something called a bog body. So I have an image for you at the bottom. A bog body is an unusual situation where the body was preserved in a PT waterlogged bog. So what does that mean? Like, what is a bog? It's kind of like a swamp and it has a very acidic environment. So when a body gets submerged in this environment, regular bacteria can't live there. And so there's not as much of a decay process and therefore the body survives much longer and the organs basically remain intact. I mean, they, they're gonna get dehydrated and they, you can see in the image that the skin has uh, changed its coloration. But if you look at the top of this image, um, there's actually still hair on this person's head. There's still facial features. There's skin and organs in there. Sometimes they can investigate the contents of the stomach. Um, if the person was wearing clothing, the clothing might still remain as well. So that's really unusual. And this particular individual, um, we were able to use radiocarbon dating to determine how old this body is. And uh, we figured out they died um, over over 2000 years ago, so about 200 BC to 400 BC, quite a long time ago. And yet, if you look at that hair, it looks like, you know, it, it still could be on someone's head today. On the right hand side, I have an image that might look familiar to you. We talked about this individual before. So this is a reconstruction of a body that was found that was mummified. Do you remember what he was called? So this is Otzi the Iceman. And his body was preserved over 5,000 years ago in the ice of a mountain. So when they were able to find his body, they also found some clothing on him. They were able to find uh, what kind of foods he ate and uh, different injuries that he had, all because he was preserved in the ice. So very cold environments is another place where bacteria are not able to cause the decay. And therefore, we do find mummies in some other uh, very cold environments like uh, Siberia, they found things like mummified mammoths, which is really cool. They've also found uh, human mummies up in the Andes mountains that were preserved. And even though they had died a long time ago, they almost looked like a modern person who was just frozen. Like they looked that, um, that recent. And I'm sure you've heard of, of course, Egyptian mummies. So that's another example. Those mummies were created on purpose where they basically dehydrated the body to the point where it was so dry that bacteria and microorganisms can't live there. So dry environments also can create mummies. Now let's move on to fossils. So what are fossils? Fossils are gonna be a little bit different than the examples I just gave you. The previous examples all still had evidence of soft tissue. In fossils, you don't have that, okay? So the, the actual living cells which died when the animal or plant died uh, has been replaced. And what happens usually is that it's been replaced by some kind of mineralization. So if it's a plant, uh, one type of fossil you might find, in, like in the image in the middle, is petrified wood, which is basically stone. So this, it looks like a tree trunk right here, is basically a, a tree trunk that the cells were replaced by rock, okay? But what's cool about that is sometimes you can still see things like the patterns in the bark. You can uh, sometimes see the rings on the tree. And we'll talk about the rings on the tree more later and how that can help you with determining age. For human and animal remains, a lot of animals that are very soft bodied, things like slugs, snails, jellyfish, those guys don't fossilize because there's nothing in them that could mineralize. The cells just decay. Usually the type of uh, fossils we find are animals that had bones or that had some kind of shell. And so bones and shells can mineralize. And so they are able to turn into stone over time as well. And those can survive for millions of years. As I mentioned, some of those earliest uh, animal evidence that we find 
are you know hundreds of millions of years old because we found them in sediment at the bottom of oceans or the bottom of what used to be oceans in the past but since then they've dried out and the rock has come up to the surface so that we were able to dig them up and find those fossils another unusual thing you might find is amber so amber is over here uh, in the this image right here and what you see is that small organisms things like bugs insects sometimes they get trapped in tree sap and the tree sap which if you've ever touched it before it's like on a pine tree the resin is very sticky so when the animal gets stuck in that it's not able to escape and it gets covered by that sap and in some cases the the sap eventually turns into this hard uh, material which is called amber that doesn't always happen okay so this is going to be less common than that usually the sap just also decays over time Another example is something called asphalt, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then we can also have things like igneous rock and trace fossils. So igneous rock and trace fossils, what happens there is that it's not the organism itself. Instead, it's usually things like impressions of the organism. So you might have impressions of leaves, impressions of an animal's body. The body has decayed, but the, the print that it left in the mud or the muck underneath of it has fossilized and turned into stone and therefore we can still see that image. So what is asphalt? Asphalt is a type of oil that is very sticky. And in this image, what I'm showing you is a very famous uh, park in LA called the La Brea Tar Pits, which are definitely worth visiting if you're in the area and you've never been. Basically what happened in the La Brea Tar Pits is that thousands of years ago, it already existed. And this tar also had liquid nearby. So animals would come to drink the liquid, but unfortunately they would get stuck in that oily residue. So think of uh, sinking into this oil, but it's so thick and sticky that you can't crawl out of it. And they would sink in there and they would die. So you can see in this image, they've reconstructed um, a mammoth family where unfortunately this mammoth is stuck in there. And then what would happen is when the prey animals got stuck, well, then the predators would be attracted to that location. And so you see uh, examples of dire wolf, which is a type of wolf that has gone extinct, as well as saber-toothed tigers also trapped in these tar pits because they went to try to eat that prey animal and they didn't realize what happened and they got stuck too. So it is called tar pits, but just so you know, the real uh, material that is here, is, it's called asphalt. Okay, so that is the correct terminology for it. And uh, the asphalt has preserved these remains, but notice that the remains are mostly skeletal remains. So the soft tissue has decayed in this situation. So what about trace fossils? Let me go over a very specific example with you, which is a very, very famous example, the Laetoli footprints. So the Laetoli footprints were found in Africa and they were one of the uh, best pieces of evidence showing us that humans were walking upright already 3.6 million years ago. And the reason we know that is because this is a trace fossil, okay? So it's not the actual organism that was there, but the footprints of that organism when it was walking across this field of ash, there was a volcano eruption at that time, and they were walking across this field of ash and the ash has fossilized. And what these are right here are the footprints of the individuals that were walking there. We have since figured out that these footprints were made by a type of hominin called Australopithecus. And they've been able to identify several different sets of footprints of different sized individuals, which are um, predicted to have been a, a male of the species as well as a female and possibly a child accompanying them who are walking across this ash. But this was definitive proof that these organisms were walking upright bipedally because you can see in the footsteps that there's no evidence of their hands going down in a, quadrup a quadrupedal form or knuckle walking or anything like that. They were definitely walking upright. So finally, let's talk about a couple different dating techniques. So if you find a fossil, how can you figure out how old is it? There's two main categories of dating techniques, relative versus chronometric. So relative means that you can figure out if it's older or younger than other objects in that same site. And you can usually narrow down approximately how old it is based on other objects that you find there. However, it doesn't give you a very specific number or date. It's a relative date, right? So it might be a quite large range. 
So examples of that would be using stratigraphy, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide, as well as things like cultural dating or chemical dating. And in this chart, there's some examples of the types of materials that you could uh, use this technique on, as well as what kind of dates it might be appropriate for. Now, what if you want a very specific numerical date? Then you would use a chronometric technique. And so one example is dendrochronology, which we'll talk about, which has to do with looking at the age of trees and other wood matter. And there's also radiocarbon dating, which is very commonly used, especially when we're looking at human remains, as well as some other types of radioactive isotopes um, and some other unusual techniques as well. So review question for you. Fossilized animal remains, including megafauna, have been discovered in the blank pits in Los Angeles. So the term I'm looking for is asphalt. Remember that for the fossilization process, it is correctly termed asphalt, even though the name of the park is the La Brea Tar Pits. Next, the Laetoli footprints are considered blank fossils. So the correct term we're looking for there is trace fossils. That's because they are not actual bones or parts of the organism. It's simply the imprint that they left behind. So here's some examples of relative dating. First of all, stratigraphy. St st stratigraphy is often used. What that actually means is it's based on the order of the layers of the strata. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about if you dig into the ground, the ground is going to come in several layers and you can already see it in this image, several layers. And each layer is often made up of different types of materials. So maybe you have a sandy layer, then you have a more muddy layer, then you have a harder, crunchier layer made of, let's say limestone, then you have another soft layer. So this happens because of various types of environmental changes that occur in that location. And as long as there's no earth movements, the layers can be very easily distinguished from each other. The main goal in stratigraphy is that you look at how deep an object is and how many layers are above it. So there's a law that we can follow, the law of superposition, which basically states that the deeper you go, like the deeper the strata is, the older that item is that is found inside of it. So something that's down here at the bottom is going to, of course, be uh, older. So this object is going to be older than this object. Okay, And that makes sense as long as nothing has moved this earth. Now, if you're in an area, for example, California, where there's a lot of earthquakes and there's earth movements and there's continental drift, which I was talking about. So the continental plates are pushing against each other. Well, what you can have happen there is that the earth is pushed up into mountains. And so sometimes you get these weird situations where someone is digging on a mountain and at the top of the mountain, they actually find fossils of organisms that used to be in the ocean because the strata have been pushed up so high. You also have to take into consideration erosion. So let's say I divided this, um, this environment here in half and on the left, there was no erosion, but on the right, let's say there was a lot of wind and water and all of this strata disappears. Well, now this strata is the top layer, but it's actually older than the top layer over here. So that is something you have to be aware of. And this is something that archeologists definitely and paleontologists also very much take into account when they are using stratigraphy. There's also something called biostratigraphy. In that case, uh, what they're using is other plant and animal remains that are within the strata to help establish how long ago uh, that time period is. So for example, if you found an organism in the strata and you know that that organism went extinct 30,000 years ago, then you know that that strata cannot be any younger uh, than 30,000 years. It has to be older than that. There's also cultural dating. Cultural dating is gonna be for relatively recent human sites because it's going to be using artifacts left by those humans. And artifacts could be things like tools, clothing items, pottery is very commonly used in archeology span because pottery can also be uh, dated in a, a chron chronometric way as well. But different styles of tools and clothing can definitely help you identify how long ago uh, that site was still being used by humans. So let's look at the chronometric dating. First of all, there's something called dendrochronology. Dendro has to do with trees. And what happens with dendrochronology is that when you cut a tree down, you cut its tree trunk, it actually has these tree rings. 
and the rings are formed because every year the tree grows. And what you can actually do is count the rings to figure out the age of the tree, how old it was when it dies. But in addition to that, what's unique about the rings is that the width of the rings depends on how successful the tree was growing that year. And this is gonna be directly linked to environmental conditions. So for example, if it was a very wet, warm uh, year, it might have a very thick ring. So you could have a very thick ring when it's warm and wet, but if it was a very cold, miserable year, it might have a very thin ring. And so you get a pattern. And what you can do is you could actually uh, cut multiple trees and compare them to each other. And you could figure out which one lived at what time period because of these patterns. So some of the patterns will overlap. So for example, uh, in this image, this first tree trunk that was cut lived between the years 1884 and 1792. But then you can find another tree and then look at the pattern. Where do they overlap? So they overlap right in this little corner. They overlap between that 1884 there and the 1884 here. But this one lived all the way to 1925. And so you keep creating this um, basically a map of what these patterns should look like. So why do we do this? Because let's say you find an item and the item was made out of wood. So maybe it was a part of a log cabin or a part of a tool, something where you can find these wood um, rings on that item. You could compare it to this existing map. So let's say the, the rings actually look like this. Then you would know that the item existed in this time period right here. And you can narrow down the age range quite specifically. Another way of getting a numerical date is using radioactive isotopes. So if you have a very old fossil, something that was hundreds of millions of years ago, you could use a type of radioactive isotope called potassium argon. So potassium argon is something you can measure in rock, specifically volcanic rocks. And what would happen is if you found an old fossil, let's say um, you think you, you expect it to be a couple million years old, you look at the rocks around it, that were found in the same stratum and you get the age of the rock using the potassium argon. Then you can figure out that if this fossil was found next to this rock, it's probably from that same time period. And I'll explain how the half-life of an isotope works in the next slide. So potassium argon has a very long half-life, which is 1.3 billion. It's gonna be used for older fossils, but there's another a radioactive isotope that we use, which is actually carbon-14. And carbon-14 has a smaller half-life, which is 5,730 years. So what does this even mean? What it means is that there's regular carbon, which is found inside of your body, okay? All organic organisms are going to have carbon in them. And the regular carbon is actually something called uh, carbon-12. So regular carbon remains carbon-12 all the time. But there's another type of carbon called carbon-14. This is a radioactive isotope. What that means is that carbon-14 is not stable. So carbon-14 decays over time. The amount of carbon-14 that remains in a body depends on how long ago it died. So even though the, the carbon-12 will remain the same, the carbon-14 will change. Why does it change? It changes because carbon-14 is made in the environment and you only get it into your body while you're alive. So if you're a plant, the way you get it into your body is through photosynthesis. Okay, so here they're showing the carbon-14 is in the air. It's gonna be found in carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is going to be absorbed into the plant matter uh, through photosynthesis. If you're an animal, on the other hand, you're going to get it by eating the plant, okay? Or by eating another animal. So other animals, of course, are going to eat each other. And so this carbon-14 gets absorbed into all of them while they're alive. Once they die, the carbon-14 starts to decay into nitrogen. And so the percentage of carbon-14 that remains gets lower and lower and lower over time. So how do we use this to our advantage? Well, I have a little graph here for you to demonstrate it. Basically, if you're still alive, you're right here, you have 100% of the carbon-14 inside of your body. But as you have passed away and it's been, uh, time has passed, the amount goes down, down, down. When we reach, 50%, which is right around here, that's the half-life, okay? So when only 50% of the carbon-14 remains, that's the half-life, and we know the exact number for that. It's 5,730 years. So if we take a measurement of this, uh, let's say this little deer here, and we find that only 50% of the carbon-14 is there, we know that it died 5,730 years ago. 
So how can we continue to use this math? What if the fossil only had 25% carbon-14 left? How old do you think it would be? So it's a little bit tricky. You can use the graph to figure it out, but you can also use some math. If this is the half-life, that means that during this time period, 5,730 years passed. But now we have to look at how much is left. So now only 50% is left. But if we go down here to 25%, 25% is half of 50%. So that means during this time period, another 5,730 years have passed. So if the fossil only has that 25% left, it means it's been about 11,460 years. And you can keep doing this math, you know, and keep going down the graph all the way um, until the, the organism is really, really long time ago that it died. Once it's over, you know, several thousand years, it's only gonna have a very tiny bit of C14 left. And for that reason, it's not gonna be that accurate. When we're looking at fossils that are millions of years old, we're not gonna be using radiocarbon dating. Instead, we would go back to that previous example of the potassium argon, just because it would have a, um, a graph very similar to this one, but its half-life would be a much larger number. Okay, and that basically wraps it up for this chapter.